Hello, welcome to Adopt NCLUS, a place of knowledge pack and commonly tested content in your NCLUS. Um, today, I decided to tackle one area um, that usually confuses um, students in terms of um, pharmacology, what to do with bladder problem. You can have overactive bladder, you can have a bladder um, that is, um, you cannot void and you have you have hesitance um to void uh, and then we're also going to talk about bph with the um, surgery for bph the benign prosthetic apiplasia um very quick one with some pharmacology in addition like i said you got to put this thing together synthesize it together you don't study pharmacology with that adding it to pathophysiology even if you're doing infectious control add pharmacology together. It will make pharmacology very easy and understandable. So um, the first thing we're going to talk about is BPH. And um, I would like to draw it and you see what it looks like. So BPH is this is a prostate. Um, if this is the urethra coming down like that and the then you go into the is the urethra is within the penile area. Okay, coming it comes out like that to the opening. And at the each side of the um urethra coming down is these structures. These are the prostate. So there's two of them on either side is the levels of the prostate. Sometimes this prostate can get bigger. It can get bigger, so they can grow like bigger. And they push on the urethra so that it basically causes some form of obstruction. It's not a true obstruction, it's getting bigger. Um, the cells are growing more than they need to, so that's what we call hyperplasia. This is not cancer, it's not equal to cancer, okay? There is no something we call dysplastic changes. Dysplastic changes usually lead to cancer. That means the cells look abnormal. These cells are growing bigger, so it's not cancer. It's just the overgrowing too fast and it causing obstruction to um, the urethra such that when you have to avoid um, it become a problem for this patient. So when you have to avoid initiation, is always a problem. Okay, the and when they initiate, see they can weak to continue the flow. So we continue flow, and that's also a problem. Um, and they they will stop quickly more than stop early than their usual flow. So they cannot empty properly. Um, sometimes it take a lot of energy to do that. Um, and this is the symptoms these patients will undergo. They take them a long time to initiate, but they cannot maintain it, and they will stop early. They cannot empty their bladder completely. So this is what we call uh, B B P H, which means benign prostatic hyperplasia. It's not cancer, okay? It's not cancer. So if they ask you such a question, they try to fool you, it's not cancer. They will have, because of this, what is happening, they will have symptoms, they will have this, they will have agency to go all the time. Um, they, 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 they will dribble, dribbling, the urine will be just dribbling and they will have frequency. So they'll go multiple times. Those are bad words that should can come into your head and say, hey, this is what is going on. So what will be your treatment? You got to help with the flow. So treatment means we got to open, okay, the, the urethra so that you can get bigger. There's two ways of doing it, okay? There's two ways of tackling um, this problem. I always a pathophysiology guy from medical school. Um, so if this is big, well, why don't we, um, why don't we make this 
smaller. So make the the the, the prostatic portion smaller. Or just uh, open the urethra. So open the urethra so that more urine can flow. So that's where we're going to focus our pharmacology. That's all. And you can answer yourself all the pharmacology questions. So uh, first, we need to slow down the hyperplasia. Okay. So we got to slow down the hyperplasia. Luckily, there's enzymes that is involved with the uh, hyperplasia. So we just attack the enzyme. And in the enzyme, um, this medication that can um, attack it. And one of them medication is this finasteride. So basically it binds to the enzyme and make it inactive and it decreases size of the prostate. So this is size of the prostate basically. So that's what you do. After we bind it, then it will can, the prostate will decrease in size and it help you um, void. So if you see an answer choice, you see this finash try, the, um, that's the alpha, uh, the enzyme that will decrease the prostate size. Another strategy is just, just basically attack, uh, make the urethra open. Okay, and so we'll, these medications uh, specifically um, can bind to receptors, okay? There's, there's alpha receptors on the prostate, okay? After we have bind the enzyme, we can also bind to and destroy alpha receptors uh, in the prostate. And these alpha receptors, uh, so alpha, Okay, so it is. It's what this medication is going to bind and open the, the prostate. And one of them is Tamsulin. We hope the prostate is basically open it and allow more urine to flow. So it prevents the contraction. Uh, the muscle is so it, the alpha blockers. They are on the muscle, so they bind to it and inhibit contraction. So inhibit, inhibit, prevent, or you can say prevent contraction um, of the smallest muscle. They so you open the urethra and more urine can flow. Okay, um, there's a, a bunch of them. Um, this is the generic. Okay, in, in case you see the other ones, this is the only one that has um, it doesn't have a zoo in it. The other ones are very, a little bit, you can identify them. Terazozines, okay. Terazozines. Terazozines. So that, that one you can see are four. Uh, the, one of them is the flow mass. You see, they have the zozine at the end. So the other one do sazozine. Uh, it's just the tomorrow. Sulin, that is, is a little bit different, but he also has the S, I, A, or uh, N in them. Or you can just divide, I usually use the Zazun, or you can use the O, S, I, N as their last name, and then recognize them. But all they're doing is alpha blocker, opening the urethra, allow more urine to flow. And this is a common medication you see in older patients all the time. And uh, it's very common. Um, in the United States because of BPH, the older people living better. So this medication he has some side effects that they can ask you in the test. So we got to talk about it because it's very important. Uh, it's an alpha broker, it's central acting, okay? Uh, he also has some central acting effect. Most central acting effect medication always causes um, some drowsiness, okay? And it causes autostatic hypertension. You've heard this before multiple times. Anything that causes autostatic hypertension, well, um, you know, kind of teaching, you're going to tell the patient what they need to do. Okay. Um, so the teaching um, 
the, the there is teaching associated with this medication. Okay, um, take it at night. So they take all these medication at night. Otherwise, they're going to fall. So there's a four rigs. So you teach them about four four rigs mitigation. Okay, you got to take care of it, and then. It causes orthostatic hypotension. Guess what? They should avoid anything, avoid anything that causes orthostatic hypotension. And one of the key ones you see it in most older patients is nitrate, Viagra. So cylindrophil. So you can see how they can have problem. First they have BPH, they can't pee. And you have to give it to them um, these uh, alpha uh, blockers. Then what happened? They take Viagra for erectile dysfunction, and they have a bunch of things that can cause hypo um, orthostatic hypotension, and that become a problem, and they were going to fall. So older patients are always in trouble with this combination of medication. The specific thing you, you should avoid with this: they shouldn't take cementidine. So I avoid cementidine. Okay, this should avoid cementidine. And that's um some of the things you should know about a the, there's report about sexual dysfunction in these medications. So sexual dysfunction in this medication too. Um and you need to tell them about it. The last thing about orthostatic hypertension, well, you know the teaching, you're going to tell them change position slowly and you take this medication at night. But you can see there's the same theme that keep on repeating itself. That's why you don't need to isolate um, um, or block your brain when you study other subjects. You got to put them together. They are systems. Every system talk to each other. So try to simplify everything. And when you're doing pharmacology, use the pathophysiology, the underlying problem. And you see that they, they will make sense. They will start coming back slowly, slowly, slowly. So this is these are the people that is affecting the, uh, the prostate, making the prostate smaller and or, or making the prostate prostatic muscle not to contract and open the urethra and more flow. So when you give this to them, they start feeling better. Now, we can also help the, we can also help the bladder, okay? Let me show you, you draw some, show you what it look like. So this is the bladder, okay? And the neck of the bladder go here and you join the urethra like that. You go into the penile area and the urethra flow through, okay? And urine come in. This is the like the penis and then this is the urethra. And this is the bladder and the, the urethra coming from top to like that. And we have our prostate on the side. The prostate is here, sitting here like that. So this is schematic. And so this is the bladder. Well, if we open this to get bigger, now we can make the bladder push more. We can let it push the urine out better. So you can um, attack the bladder muscle. Okay, the struzer, that's the name of it. You can attack the bladder muscle and let them empty more. And this issue, it should come to you right away as soon as I said that. What uh, receptor is on the bladder that help with bladder uh, contraction, bowel contraction, salivation. You've heard it multiple times. I, if you check one of the, my video, how to study and put things together, it's cholinergic, okay? Cholinergic. Cholinergic stuff uh, is what causes bladder contraction. Okay, so you give them any medication that has cholinergic in it. And uh, for bladder medication, or other cholinergic, they have specific names. Most cholinergic have this last name. I've learned to recognize the last name is call. Um, so if they give you answer choice and you don't know what it is, C-C-H-O-L, 
it looks like core. It's no low. You see, there's no L O L like in beta block is no. This is core C H O. So one of the medication that is very common is betanocore. And then we it can help the bladder to contract and empty easily. Okay, you can so it's a cholinergic. And then when you hear the word cholinergic, you should be saying to yourself, okay. Patient can go into cholinergic crisis. So you can have a side effect based on what I said earlier on. Okay, side effect, if it's cholinergic, well, it's going to um, do what? It's going to make them um, pee more, okay? Increase urinary output. But what is his side effect? Well, they can have diarrhea or abdominal pain, cramping. And then they can increase salivation, right? And then the 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 people can constrict. Right. So those are all cholinergic effects that um you don't want, but that's what you left with. Okay, that's what we left with. So all these things, um, if you start thinking about it and put it together. Like, okay, it makes sense. Okay, it makes sense. And then, and then so that when they give you a side effect, they, to, they tell you, are you going to teach them? Well, then you can use this to teach them. Your urine output is going to increase. You're going to have a diarrhea. You're going to have the abdominal pain. You can have, uh, you salivate more. Your people is going to constrict. Um, so um, you can educate them as expected, like, this medication has to be taken empty stomach. So that's those medications. Um, there's only a few of them. The dose that causes bladder contraction is betanocor. And they all if they give you another one and they put core at the end, is basically um it's going to help the bladder. It's a cholinergic um medication that is going to help the bladder um move forward and empty itself easily without any problem. Okay. Now, since we talk about the prostate, let's talk about sometimes we treated them with medication, it's not helpful. So the BPH, so meds not helping. Well, we can make the bladder small, we can make the prostate smaller. So this is the, we can, we can go back and say, well, if this is the urethra, Okay, the penile area and the urethra here and the prostate is big like that. I can make it smaller. Okay, I can um, make it smaller. Uh, if the enzyme is not helping, penastride is not helping, I can take a little bit portion of it and remove it. So we can take them to surgery and remove it. The surgery that we do is, is called TERF. I mean, you see transurethra. So I told you scientists don't know how to name things. So they, they just describe it. Transurethra, that means we go through here, we go through the urethra. Okay, transurethra. Um, so that's the TU. Okay, we section. So we're removing it of the prostate. So we go through the urethra take a little bit of the prostate and come out. There's no incision anywhere. Don't let them trick you. No incision. Everything go through the urethra, through the penile, penile area, and then we remove the, um, the problem. Usually they, they are in the hospital like one to, to, to two to three days uh, at least. Um, at the end of the case, the, the, the prostate is a highly vascular organ. So it bleeds, it bleeds. So bleeding, your number one page, uh, priority in patients who have TERP is bleeding precaution. So you're looking for bleeding, okay? You are looking for bleeding. So you want to prevent bleeding as much as possible. That's your job at the nest. And so that's the main thing you want to prevent it as much as possible. Um, and what are the things to prevent it? Well, they should not be straining. Okay, 
and then no constipation. So you got to give them stool softener. But this is the caveat. No suppository. Nothing go into the rectum. The rectum, anterior portion of the rectum is where the prostate is. If you So if you put your finger in the rectum and you put a suppository there, you're destroying the prostate, prostate bed that has been removed and that will cause bleeding. So absolutely no suppository. If you want to give them, they, they want to prevent constipation, let them take the medication by mouth. But no suppository, absolutely no, no, three times no, because they will trick you with that, okay? They shouldn't be doing heavy lifting. All these things cause pressure in the pelvis, so then they will bleed. These are the things you teach them you not know, to do and some of the things you do. What the surgeon will do is to prevent bleeding, to help you. So these patients have three-way catheter. So they have a catheter, I will draw it for you. So if this is the Foley catheter, so this is the catheter like that. There's a one just for drainage of this go into the drainage bag, okay? Then there is one that is for irrigation. This is for irrigation. And there's one just for balloon. So this is the balloon here. And so there's a balloon here. So this is, is going to sit where the uh, prostate is going to be, used to be and causes pressure. So it, it tamponade, the balloon is a tamponade. So it prevents bleeding at the bed. Um, so you can blow the balloon here and this is to irrigate. So fluid go there, irrigate it and the, from all the clots and it come back. So they have something we call three-way catheter. That means it has three ports. That's all, you have to know that. Uh, there's a three-way catheter used at the end of a uh, uh, tub. And then he, he, he's, doing two th he's doing a couple of things. He's irrigating for bleeding. Then tamponade, okay, balloon. So it's, it's just basically preventing the um the um what do they call it? the the pressure is applying pressure um in the in the base of where the prostate used to be to prevent further bleeding okay um and that is very very important the importance of that okay so that is going to prevent further bleeding the then you irrigating and then they are getting urine out so there's things that you have to know specifically about this. What do you expect? So whether next generation questions or right now questions, there's things you have to know what is expected after a third, expected finding. So expected finding of a third. So one, the urine is supposed to be pink. Okay, it's pink urine. You see a pink urine in the back here. Secondly, sometimes they can be clot. So you can see some clots, small, small clots, one to three days. That's normal. But you, when you see that, you got to increase irrigation. So you increase the irrigation so that it will prevent clotting the first one to three days. So you can increase more irrigation through the other port. If you see clot, clot after three days is not good, not good. So that means it's bleeding, signs of bleeding. So the doctor needs to know about it, signs of bleeding. But after three days, it's not good. Your priority, number one priority, is to ensure pink urine. Pink urine, so that's all you're checking, you're irrigating and checking uh, pink urine. Uh, you monitor the patient, you avoid all the things that we talk about, um, and then the pressure being um, provided, 
um, this is the same thing of balloon tamponade. What he's doing is pressure, pressure at the at the bed, the bed of the tri where they did the surgery at. Um, expected finding again is a bladder. We already did surgery. Every time you operate on the bladder, the bladder muscle doesn't like that. It go into spasm. So when they give you a patient who had a tub and he's having spasm, this is okay. You are not being sharp. Okay. If you worry about this, you are not being sharp. If you worry about your this clot, yes, that's hemorrhage, shock. So we're looking for pink urine. After three days, we have to be sharp about it. Okay. We have to be sharp. Prioritization. You have to be sharp because patient is bleeding. They're not going to tell you the patient is bleeding. They will say four days, five days, you're seeing large clot in the fully back. That is B sharp. Check my this thing, prioritization, B sharp. They're bleeding. And you have to do something. Call the doctor, intervene as much as possible. Pink urine is good. Spasm, spasm in the pelvis is, is fine. Nothing wrong with it. Okay. Uh, nothing wrong with it. There may be a calculation question they can ask you. When I, we were, I was a resident, we do this. We have to physically do that. So this is the patient. He has the Foley in the bladder. Because everybody is going to make urine, well, he's going to make his own urine. But you also put in fluid through this, through the irrigation to irrigate the prostatic bed. That fluid should come out. So the total urine in this bag is the one the patient is making and the one you are irrigating. So you have to know this from that total output is equal to irrigation input plus urine from patient. So the urine you see in the bag is made up of irrigation input for then the urine from the actual patient. So let me give you an example. If you, they tell you total output, okay, is 700. And you put in irrigation, 400. That means patient P urine output from the actual urine output is 300. That means patient had 300 you irrigate 400, that's why total 400. If you put in 700, if you, the other question they can ask you, if you put in input, input 300, okay? And you get, um, let's see, yeah. And you get just 100 output in the bag, something is wrong. You're not getting what you want, what you put in, and even is less. That means the thing is blocked. The patient is bleeding. It's a sign of bleeding. Bleeding will make the foliate clot. So if you put you irrigate with 300 and the output from the bag, total output is 100. That means you've lost 200 and the patient even is not making urine. This is an emergency. You need to let the doctor know right away. If you get if you put in three hundred irrigation and a output total output is three hundred, then you know the patient is dry. He's not making his own urine, and you can give them more fluid, not irrigation fluid, but more fluid so that he can pee. Just know this calculation can happen. It's easy calculation, but if you have to now understand the pathophysiology of the whole thing, what is going on in the output, and that will give you an idea exactly um, what you need to um, do. The last thing about this is, this is dangerous, okay? Um, and BPH and irrigation. Tap, irrigation, post-op. It can be dangerous, patient, I mean, it's really, it's not easy thing that you, know, you gotta be, you should, it's not something you should play with. We give them a large amount of fluid to the irrigation catheter to irrigate the prostate bed. 
and this can lead to hyponatremia because all, if all the fluid get absorbed into our system, so it's due to absorption, absorption of fluid into the blood. So, and that causes severe hyponatremia and you know hyponatremia is not good. They go, they will have a seizure, okay, they go into coma, okay. Um, they also are, will have autonomic uh, instability. That means their pressure pressure will go up, BP up or down, okay. Um, they will be tachycardic, um, all this, they will start vomiting, okay? And they will have visual changes. You see some of the symptoms, all is like really bad stuff is happening. All this thing is happening. That is what we call, um, this is what we call, let me use another color. All this is what we call TERP syndrome. So if they give you a question, Somebody at TERP is getting fluid and uh, three way catheter irrigation, and all of a sudden, uh, his blood pressure goes up, down, is having visual changes, you have the nausea, he's vomiting, um, seizure likes, in, and you, you check the potassium, a, a lab, and he put sodium is really, really low. This is what we call TERP syndrome. You need to have high um, level of suspicion, okay? high level of suspicion. You are 10, I need to go up and say, oh, this is step syndrome. Otherwise, they're going to get sick. So they have like bad symptoms. It's because all the irrigation fluid wash the prostate bed and it get absorbed. So you get like severe fluid and they can even go into pulmonary edema. Uh, so I just remember pulmonary um, edema. So you see, they get fluid overloaded in addition to dilutional hyponatremia. That's bad. You can't do that. And you should know how to treat this. Treatment, you should know by now, um, if you're taking your test in a few days from now, um, hyponatremia and somebody who have symptoms with hyponatremia, you should give them three to five, either three or five percent, three or five percent sodium chloride. Okay, you shouldn't run it fast, it slowly, okay? If you go too fast, if you correct it too fast, they, they get central uh, pontine malinosis. Basically, they call it lock-in syndrome, okay? So you don't want that, lock-in syndrome. They cannot do anything. They will be looking at you, you're talking to them, but they cannot move, they cannot do anything. All the model system is all destroyed from that. So send CPM, um, I don't know if they ask you that, but it's good to know. If you correct hyponatremia too fast, okay, assuming the sodium is 125, you can go up to like two units, 127, slowly or 128 for like a day, and slowly you increase it up. Don't go all the way to 135. If you do that, you create something, you create so, uh, fluid, that there will be so much fluid shift, and that will lead to central pointing uh, malinosis and that's locking syndrome. We don't want that. So TEP, you can have TEP syndrome, high level of suspicion to prevent that. So that's what we talk about. Now we have a bladder and the BPH, they need to, they need the edge to go. They can go, they're pushing and we have them open it up and push it up and we push the bladder to empty the urine. These people, they, they hate us uh, because their bladder is like overactive. It's like, no, I'm, I'm pumping no matter what. So this is the bladder, okay? And then you go to the penile area with the urethra in, in it like that. These people, the bladder is on fire. It's like, it can take any urine, any small urine here, even if there's tiny urine here, no, this gets stimulated. And it, the bladder won't empty. So it's, it keep on contracting, contracting. You may have seen it in another form. They would, they would say it's edge incontinence. It's the same thing. Some of these uh, G, uh, 
urology problem, they have the same names, but if you understand what it is, it, it becomes easy. So edge is different from stress. Stress incontinence is when there's too much intra-abdominal pressure and you push on the bladder and they leak, the woman will leak or the man will leak. Mostly it's the women who have this problem, then it will leak. Um, edge incontinence means the bladder cannot slow down. Any little urine will make the bladder empty. And so they cannot make it to the bathroom, they embarrassed. And so what do you think you can do for them? Pathophysiology. If your brother is contracting too much, I will tell them, shut up, stop contracting, slow down. So we slow down the, the bladder so that we can increase his capacity. He can take more urine, okay? Improve his ability and uh, capacity of the urine to take more urine. He can slow down, so improve his capacity so that he can, he can slow down. And you've heard about it. This is what we call antispasmodic medication. So anything you've heard on the, you know, you've seen it over the counter, they sell it when you go Walmart to see them. These are what they are doing. They're telling the bladder to slow down, chill out, okay? We don't need you to be contracting too much, okay? It's fine. And they specific, they have, um, you have to know them, you have to know their names, and then you've you heard about them before. So one of them is this. They are all, before I give you their names, guess what? Cholinergic causes the bladder to contract. So what will cause the bladder not to contract? Anticholinergic. Any medication you can think of that is anticholinergic, you can use it. Even medication for um, the, um, respiratory, if they, they get into the circulatory system, they can cause anticholinergic effect on the bladder. But this medication, I'm going to give you the specific for the bladder, but any other anticholinergic can do the same thing. So when you give it to them and they ask you a question, you should be thinking about those medications too. But this is what, if you go to Walmart, you see they was listed it as overactive bladder, um, edge incontinence um, um, medications. And there's few of them and they, they classic. So oxybutin, and this is the ditropan. You heard before, ditropan, this is what it is. And then this is what they like because they know everybody um, know about and ditropan. So they give you this medication. This is detro, teluridine, so uh, totiridine. To, to so they, they know everybody knows about it. So they always like to give you totiridine, which is detro LA. Okay. And then the la third one um, is that when we I always have problem with that. That one is solifinancing. I mean, so it's also one of those medications. You just have to memorize and say, oh, this is for, I bet you when they give you a question, they will add this one, the anti-colonergic to the colonergic group. And all you need to do is distinguish between the colonergic. The colonergic guys, the specific for bladder, they have core, C-H-O-L. The rest will not have core. Anything that has no core, it's not cholinergic. So then you have to think, what kind of problem am I treating? Am I treating an edge incontinence or overactive, uh, um, we, um, which is the same or somebody who has hesitancy, basically cannot go like BPH or something like that, or they have urinary retention. Remember, BPH is a form of urinary retention. So if somebody have urinary retention, you can give them the call to empty it out. You know, overactive bladder, usually they have edge incontinence, so you want to slow them down. So these are the three medication um, you, you should know about. But the one you've seen it before in um, respiratory is those with the opium at the last name, prosopium, okay? They also do the same thing. They are called uh, anticholinergic, so they will slow down the the bladder. I don't have even have to bother you too much about what you expect on anticholinergic. Well, I can what what is going to happen? Where well, they're going to urinary retention. You can go into retention. So you let them know. Make sure if they don't pee, they let you know about it. 
um, they will have constipation, okay? Because uh, you slow down the gut, then the, 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 the dry mouth, they cannot salivate, right? And then they can worsen your glycoma. If you have glycoma, you got to tell them about it. Uh, and because of this effect, it dilates the um the the, the your pupil. Um, basically, it's going to have drowsiness based on the um central acting effect. Every anticholinergic will call drowsiness, and then they will have heat intolerance. Okay, they have heat intolerance. So this is your satire right there. And we can teach them. If you see any urine retention, just let me know. Constipation, what do you tell them? Well, eat some fiber, hydrate yourself, exercise. Okay, stool softener doesn't prevent constipation. So just a fiber, hydrate yourself, and exercise. Dry mouth, what do you tell them? Take sugar-free, sugar-free candies. You see, this is, I've said it in my video all the time. You become natural. You know you can say sugar-free candy or um, chewing gum, okay, to help with that, okay? Um, if you have glycoma, well, don't take it. Don't, okay? Drowsiness, well, be careful. You can't drive with it, okay? Somebody have to drive you. If you have to take, uh, take it, let somebody drive you. And so, and then eat incontinence. You can go out in the sun. You shouldn't do that. So summer vacation, you got to be careful. When you go, don't go into the sun. So avoid the sun too much because, or any hot place because you have heat intolerance. So you see how the teaching doesn't, you don't have to memorize it, but you're using what you know. These are the side effects of the medication and you teach them how to prevent it. I said it all the time. Pathophysiology give you content. Content give you the ability to find signs and symptoms. Signs and symptoms is what you're going to use to educate them and teach them. And if they make a mistake, you intervene. You come in full circle. Therefore, the underlying problem of every disease process is a pathophysiology. Try to understand why people have glycoma if you understand it, you can treat it. Try to understand what is going on with overactive bladder. If you understand it, then if I have to treat it, I just slow down the bladder and tell the bladder to keep quiet. Slow down. I don't need you to be all ramp up, okay, so that I can do my job. Now, what are they teaching to prevent this? People who already have this, and you want to teach them, to improve it before even you give them medication well decrease the risk factor of that you already have over edge incontinence okay don't drink any irritant bladder irritant i call it let me use the another word bladder irritant avoid it avoid it completely and there's some things in your body we we do most system, body system, there's few of them. You always see them. Alcohol, smoking, they are always there. And and and, and you can tell that something is wrong and caffeine, okay, coffee. Something is why is this group every disease process they there? Because they irritant. They just basically make things go faster. If you take them, you have diarrhea, you drink and your bladder doesn't like them, so avoid all this irritant, alcohol, smoking, and caffeine, okay? And then you, know, you got to let them improve their pelvic floor exercise, so they do like Kegel exercise, so that they can hold a little bit better, okay? Um, and you can teach them to void every two hours, okay? Void every two hours. Um, then that will prevent them from having any bladder because the bladder cannot doesn't want to hold anything um, in his uh, in his uh, cavity anymore because when small urine goes there, it makes his uh, bladder go into spasm and then you have an accident. So learn how to void every two hours, um, do a pelvic floor exercise to improve your muscle and avoid any irritants that will will, will make you sick. Some fruits can do that. I know some some fruit juices when you drink 
it make you bad. So I think yes, yeah, citrus, um, uh, citrus fruits, just I mean avoid them. Yeah, it, it, some of them um have irritant in them and they make you really go. Okay, so this is everything I can think of that they can ask you um related to this subject. We've covered pharmacology, we've covered two um problem overactive edge incontinence and hesitancy uh, bladder that can uh, contract. Um the BPH stuff, very important, especially the transurethral rectal uh, resection of the prostate. What you do post up anticipated finding, um, especially how to calculate the input and then what you see in the Foley catheter. Pink is okay. Pink is what you want. It's okay to have some clot up to three days, but after three days, we have to be sharp, and that is hemorrhage. I hope um, you get something out of this. Take care of yourself and keep charging, and all the best of luck. And subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Take care of yourself.